All right. Well, I want to thank uh, Justin McKinney for joining us today for our uh, February 18th late Sabre Day Bud Matheny chapter meeting. Uh, Justin is going to uh, give us some information about the Union League, which uh, I have to admit I've never heard about. So I'm looking forward to uh, Justin's presentation. And then uh, our own Paul Boren will uh, give us uh, a discussion on 1960s baseball that he's uh, putting together for his uh, class at the uh, uh, William and Mary Adult Learning Institute uh, this coming spring. So uh, without further ado, Justin, I will turn it over to you. Sure, no problem at all. Uh, well, thank you for having me. I'm look forward to discussing uh, the Union Association with y'all. And I'm just going to share my screen here. I'll just be a moment until I get my presentation open. Hello, Ray. How are you today? All right. Okay. Can everyone see uh, that it's looking good? Yep. Okay, great. Well, I'll get started. So now I'll talk to you all about the Union Association, which uh, kind of had a brief tumultuous existence uh, from 1883 to 1885, with its single year of play being 1884. Um, so to understand why the Union Association came to be, uh, it's helpful to look back a little bit, um, a couple of years, 1882 and 1883. Essentially, the American Association formed in 1882 as a rival to the National League, which had formed in 1876. And during the season 1882, it was relatively little warfare between the two leagues. But in the off season after 1882, it sort of exploded with um, a lot of uh, contract jumping, contract offers, um, teams were signing players left and right. And then teams would sign those same players to other contracts. And there was a lot of, um, I guess, conflict between the two leagues. Um, there was a lot of uncertainty about where players would be playing. Uh, teams could not figure out what the rosters were going to be for the coming season. And eventually this led to um, what came to be known as the National Agreement or the Tripartite Agreement, which was signed between the National League and the American Association, as well as the newly formed Northwestern League. Um, essentially, prior to the 1883 season, which sort of set in place um, and solidified the reserve rule um, in a much stronger way than it had been before and sort of created a peace between the AA and the NL um, as well as the Northwestern League. It sort of gave like organized baseball some structure and ensured that um, players um, could be counted on to fulfill their contracts, that sort of thing. Um, and so, yeah, each club in the agreement could reserve up to 10 players for the coming year. Um, it meant that um, anyone who had been reserved couldn't sign with another club, whether they'd signed a contract or not. Um, and this ensured peace for the 1883 season, which in fact turned out to be the most profitable and successful baseball season to date. Um, the Philadelphia Athletics, they set an attendance record with over 200,000 fans on the season, which is very exceptional for the time. Um, and baseball was really booming. It, it showed that um, there was, you know, the NL and A both had like really strong uh, top clubs and uh, also, there was a number of minor leagues that had started to open up as well. And Justin, so, how many how many games did they play? Uh, in in eighteen eighty three or so, I think they were playing about uh, the schedule. I think was probably around 110, 120 games. Um, so two hundred thousand fans across, like probably about fifty to sixty home games. Like that was quite good for the time. If as we'll see, like if you drew it, if you drew crowds in the in the like four to five thousand range per game, that was exceptional for for the era. So, and so with this booming baseball climate, um, in September eighteen eighty three, the Union Association announces its intentions to uh, form as an eight team league, and they're going to do something bold in that they're going to ignore the reserve rule, which. Um, is the thing that had created this baseball piece had helped to facilitate some of this prosperity. Um, and they're going to set themselves in opposition to basically all of organized baseball by doing so. Um, and yeah, they're planning to rival the AA and the NL, and they put teams in cities that already have clubs. And they're formed by a guy called Al Pratt, who had founded the Pittsburgh Allegheny Club, which is the Pittsburgh Pirates franchise in 1880. And he had been their first manager um, and he's, he'd been fired in mid-1883, but he's the 
well-known figure in, in Pittsburgh baseball and the owner of the Washington Nationals Club, uh, Henry B. Bennett, he is named the first president of the league in the first meeting on September uh, 12th, I believe, in 1883. And so for the season, <laughs> what happens once the Union Association announces its, its formation, um, it sets off a bunch of expansion um, at all levels of baseball. Uh, so the UA forms, the American Association expands to 12 teams in an effort to thwart the Union Association. So they put clubs in cities where the Union had planned to put teams. And in the case of Washington, they actually put a team in Washington to rival the Washington Nationals. And then the Eastern League forms as a minor league. They actually feature a team in Richmond, Virginia. Excuse me. Uh, the Northwestern League expands from eight to 12 teams. Um, and they're, they're located in Indiana and Michigan and Minnesota and like that region of the country, um, sort of the Midwest. And then a number of other minor leagues form across the country and in Canada as well. So it sets off there's it's this huge rush for the players. There's more people being paid to play professional baseball than at any time in history um, up to that point. And so on the left is a uh, woodcut of Al Pratt as he appeared uh, in August of 1883, shortly before the Union Association was formed, and then Henry Bennett is the yeah, he was the first president of the league. And so essentially, like for September and October, after it's first formed, um, there's a lot of discussion about the league, and there's like rumors that players have been signed and all that sort of stuff. But it doesn't really get going until uh, late October when Henry Lucas, who is a 26 year old millionaire from St. Louis. Um, he officially joins the league with the plans to put a club in his hometown of St. Louis. And so essentially once he joins the league, there's all this money now um, and Lucas becomes the dominant kind of force um, in pushing the league from a concept to an actual reality. And then he becomes soon becomes the president and he becomes like the figurehead, the spokesperson, everything that the league is associated with. It becomes like Lucas's league and all that sort of stuff. And he makes this huge splash by targeting established and reserved major league stars. Um, this included Fred Dunlap, who was at the time was the best second baseman in baseball, Uri Duke Schaefer, who was the hard hitting outfielder, and Dave Rowe, who was another talented uh, young player who had just come off a 300 bed season in, in the American Association. Um, and this sort of ticked off the rest of baseball and baseball's establishment and so it kicked off this tumultuous war between the ua and virtually every league and team in the country and there's henry lucas as he looked sort of later in life um, but keep in mind in 1883 he's a 26 year old uh young man who is a millionaire in 1883 dollars so he's he's quite quite the character and there's a uh, dave Rowe on the left and fred dunlap on the right and so the big thing that ends up sort of defining the league, and if you um, have read anything about the league, you know there's this huge competitive imbalance and a lot of debates about the quality of the play in the league. Um, and a part of that is because of the different way each team sort of composes uh, the club. So essentially they're forming with eight teams. They're going to start in mid-April of 1884, and all the different teams sort of take these different approaches to building their rosters. So Altoona, Pennsylvania, um, which is a city of about 19,000 people. It's, I think, still the smallest uh, city to be home to a major league club. Um, they had formed as a minor league club with a bunch of low-level minor league players and semi-pros, and only Jack Leary had MLB experience on the roster. Uh, Baltimore and Chicago, they were owned by the same person. It was a guy called Albert H. Hendrickson, who was a Baltimore uh, local, um, really involved in baseball there. And he actually signed um, a pool of players in the Northwestern League. And all these guys signed for a salary of about $1,200 a year, which was a pretty modest, like average salary for like, if you were a low level major league player, that would be about what you get. And so this is a pretty good salary for like to get, but also cheaper than what Lucas is playing for these major league stars. Um, and they only signed Hugh Daly, um, who's a, a one arm pitcher from Cleveland who had pitched a no hitter the previous year. It's very, talented but uh difficult difficult guy uh but throws incredibly hard and um he's the only sort of major league star on either roster so they've got pool about 25 players and he's the only one who you could really call a star player and then boston uh they actually joined the league in march of 1884 and they had a month to put together the club and the ballpark um and they signed a bunch of aged and problematic boston legends like tommy bond who um was 
one of the best pitchers of the 1870s, but he threw almost 4,000 innings by the time he was 24 and hadn't pitched regularly since 1880. Um, and then Tommy McCarthy, who remains the only uh, Union Association alumni in the Hall of Fame, he was signed as a sandlotter from the local Boston sandlots uh, to join. And so it's like they signed these old Boston guys who were like legendary players and then these young players who have no background but might have some promise. And then Cincinnati, uh, they signed a few major league regulars and then have a mix of Midwestern talent. Uh, Philadelphia, they take a very similar approach to Boston. Um, they signed a bunch of aged Philadelphia legends, uh, including a bunch of players who had started in the National Association. Um, and many had not played baseball since like the mid 1870s, like professionally. And they also signed a bunch of local youngsters. Uh, St. Louis had undoubtedly the strongest roster in the league. Uh, they had multiple established stars. And opening day, they had seven players who were major league regulars in 1883 in the roster. So they were just much stronger than everyone else. And then Washington was for mostly of local Washington players. Um, and the 1883 had uh, been a semi-pro club. Um, and so, yeah, the, again, you get a sense of there's some teams really try to sign star players. There's other teams that are just forming almost as like semi-pro clubs and joining the league. And that's uh, woodcuts of the uh, St. Louis Unions as they appeared on opening day uh, in 1884. And that's a photo of the Washington Nationals as they appeared in August of 1884 after going through a number of roster changes. And here's a photo of the Boston Unions as they appeared in early April of 1884. And those two photos are the only two known team photographs of uh, union association clubs. There's a few individual photos of St. Louis union players, but there's virtually no photographic evidence of union association stuff. So uh, I just want to share those with you because uh, I'm very happy to at least have these. And so as you can see, this competitive imbalance uh, becomes like the thing, the hallmark of the league and, and sort of its greatest thing that you notice if you, if you look at like the the records of the clubs now, um, you just notice this huge disparity. Um, so essentially from opening day onward, this is just a huge issue. Uh, St. Louis becomes the class of the league and they start the season 20 and 0, which sounds very impressive, but then they also, that includes eight blowout losses of the pathetic Altoona club. I think they're outscored by over hundred runs in those eight games. Um, and then Washington and Philadelphia also really are clearly overmatched by the stronger clubs in the league. And then St. Louis, Cincinnati, Baltimore, and Boston are the four clubs that um, sort of are in the league for the whole season that are kind of probably the best clubs in the league, uh, with St. Louis and Cincinnati in particular being kind of the cut above. And so this leads us to our first casualty. Uh, so uh, Altoona had struggled on the field, and they were completely overwhelmed by all but the league's worst clubs. Um, attendance was underwhelming, and even though they had a, a low salary list, uh, the club was a money loser. And so on May 31st, just six weeks into the season, they played their last game and they disbanded. Um, they had finished with a record of 6-17. and 17. Uh, Lucas uh, was given the chance to bail out the club, but he refused um, just on the belief that I think that Altoona was kind of making the league look bad. Um, they were getting kind of made fun of in the press. They weren't making money. And then uh, he just, I think, wanted a fresh start. Um, and so that put the league down to seven teams. So that meant they had to find a replacement. And there's a photo of the Altoona club as they appeared in 1883 when they were a minor league club, uh, but they feature a number of the same players. I, I don't know about the uniforms if they changed for 1884. It's hard to, hard to tell, if, but that's sort of how they looked in 1883. And then um, this sort of triggers a series of failures. Um, Kansas City is selected to replace Altoona, and Kansas City becomes the first professional club in the history of Kansas City, as well as the first major league club in the history of Kansas City. Um, they joined the league in early June and debut on June 10th. Um, so they essentially formed within about 10 days, uh, comprised of a roster of mostly players, local players, and a few like uh, players, spare players from other rosters in the Union Association. Uh, the Philadelphia Keystones become the next club to fold. Uh, they disband on August 8th. So they are about $10,000 in the hole at the time, and they have a 21 and 46 record. Uh, they're competing both against the Philadelphia Phillies and the Philadelphia Athletics, who each draw very well, while the Keystones are typically drawing crowds of um, 200 fans or less a game. Uh, and so, yeah, they're, they're just, there's no hope for them to make any money or turn things around. And they were replaced by the Eastern League champion Wilmington Club, who had dominated the Eastern League and went 51-12. and 12. 
um, but they join the Union Association in mid-September and they go just two and 16. Um, and then they just, they, so they join in, in uh, August and then they disband in September. So they last just about a month and they go to 16. And then the Chicago club, uh, they moved to Pittsburgh in late August. And then eventually they merged back with Baltimore. So if you remember Chicago and Baltimore, they're both owned by the same person. So essentially that puts the league down to six clubs uh, in mid-September and they have still have a month left on the season. And on the left is a photo of uh, Ted Sullivan, who uh, started the season as the manager of the St. Louis Unions. He he quit the team with a record of 29 and 4. And then he goes and he joins with the Kansas City franchise, buys buys the, buys the rights to them, and ends up uh, sort of kind of trying to make baseball work in Kansas City. And then Albert Henderson on the right, who was the owner of the Chicago and Baltimore franchises. And it's kind of a forgotten figure in the history of baseball. But it's very fundamental and central to the formation and the um, survival of the Union Association to the end of the season. So despite these failures, there is some successes. Um, St. Louis dominated the league, um, and they ended up turning a profit. Um, they had excellent attendance that rivaled the St. Louis Brown Stockings, which are now the Cardinals. And the Brown Stockings had been one of the best drawing teams in baseball um, and was on the verge of becoming a dynasty. Uh, and so the fact that they could hold the own at the gate with them was pretty impressive. Um, the Washington Nationals were a weak club on the field, but uh, the city's uh, American Association franchise was so poor that they lost the battle for fans and disbanded in August. So the Union Association actually won the battle for Washington in terms of fan support. And um, yeah, essentially they built a strong following. They drew very well and they also paid the lowest salaries in the league. So that made them very profitable. I believe they made over $12,000 on the year, which was quite quite good for baseball at the time. And then Kansas City uh, also drew very large crowds. They played Sunday games, which was, um, not, the Union Association had a policy where they allowed teams to play Sunday games, but some cities just did not want to. But Kansas City was one of the ones that did. Um, and they often would draw like 8,000 fans for a Sunday game. And apparently there's all these anecdotes of people shooting off guns in the crowd and things like that. It's literally the Wild West in 1884. Um, and so Kansas City ends up doing very well, even though they stink because they pay those salaries. The, there's novelty of like the fan support um, and the club ends up being quite profitable as well. And when the Washington Club and the American Association folds, it actually gives birth to an, a space for um, the Richmond Virginians um, who become, I think, the first uh, major league club in the history of Virginia. Uh, and so... Richmond, they had also played in the Eastern League along with Wilmington, um, and they'd been in preliminary discussions to join the Union Association for the season. Um, and they went 28 and 30, so they were kind of mediocre. Uh, and as sort of all these leagues and teams start to collapse, because 1884 is also the year of too much baseball, uh, essentially the uh, Washington folds and they have a Hole in the American Association, and Richmond actually joins up to finish the season. Um, they proved to be mildly better than Washington. They went 12 and 30 and 4 uh, to finish the season. Um, and after the season, they booted from the American Association uh, as the league uh, contracted back down to eight teams because 12 teams is kind of too much. And then Richmond rejoined the Eastern League for 1885. So that's brief history of the Richmond Virginians. Hey, Justin, the yes. Kansas City is pretty far west. I mean, yes. 1884. So train travel, I have to assume, was well, how, the way they got back and forth. Didn't yep. that? I mean, did they? How did they? How did they make any money because of all the travel costs? I would think they would have coming east. I'm glad you mentioned that. That's like a huge issue for the league, um, and essentially that's the reason why Kansas City ends up being really difficult to uh, make work because uh, it they end up. Uh, having other opportunities in the major leagues after the Union Association. Essentially, Kansas City in 1884 is a 12-hour train ride from St. Louis, which is the furthest most west city aside from Kansas City. Um, and that ends up being a big issue because teams on the road, they, um, the Union Association has what's called the $75 guarantee. So the road team will get paid $75 for each road game by the home team. And this is meant to entice teams to show up for the games and complete the trip and all that sort of stuff, but it's not enough to cover costs for, for the team. And mm -hmm. so you end up having these teams go on these like six week road trips with, they're very expensive, traveling all across the country. And the big reason why Altoona actually got chosen 
was because they were a railroad hub that sort of was a bridge between the east and west. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, essentially, like these teams go on these road trips, and it uh, it often backtrips with teams. So the the typical pattern when a team disbands is that they finish their homestand and then they disband before they want to go back on the road because they want to take make as much money as they can at home and then not have to spend any money going on the road. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, that's a big issue. Um, and yeah, when a team goes away for six weeks, it's you know it kills off the home support as well as not being very lucrative otherwise. And this is an issue for all of baseball. We're trying to be profitable. Um, it's kind of a challenge. And so, yeah, essentially this um, $75 guarantee doesn't do the trick because if a team draws zero fans on the, like at a game with 100 fans, they're obligated to pay $75. But if they drew 5,000 fans, they're still paying the same amount. So there's no, like, as a go team, you don't get any benefit of good home attendance by the, like, when you're visiting and you also like you know you also there's a chance you might not get paid out at all so it's it's kind of just yeah this is a big issue for the union association um but yeah back on track uh so essentially with these two spots um the union association looks to the northwestern league which was basically on the verge of collapse for the second half of the season and so by mid-september there's only a couple of clubs left in the league um and so they recruit Milwaukee and St. Paul to join the Union Association to complete their schedule. Um, and so, yeah, Milwaukee's actually given the benefit of only playing home games. So that's a huge enticement for them. Uh, so they get to just, you know, stay at home, have teams come into town and then uh, keep reap the rewards of, and they drew quite well as well. So they actually turned quite a good profit. I think they played 12 home games and made $3,000 in profit according to their own records. And that's pretty, pretty strong. Hey, Justin, where did yes. these teams pop up from Milwaukee, St. Paul, Kansas City, all the rest? I mean, were their owner, were they semi-pro and just decided they were going so, to be pro? So Kansas City formed kind of out of nothing. Like it didn't exist at the start of June and by June 10th, they're on the ball field. So that comes out of nothing. Um, the Milwaukee and St. Paul clubs, they were actually in the Northwestern League. And so they were actually like, um, Northwestern League is probably the, like, in 1883, it was the best league outside of the two major leagues. Um, and it had a number of like future star players like John Clarkson, who won 300 games, got a start in, in the Northwestern League. So a bunch of the Northwestern clubs have Northwestern League clubs have really strong pitching. And a lot of those pitchers end up going to be some of the best pitchers of the of the decade. Um, and so yeah, Milwaukee and St. Paul were both Northwestern League clubs. So they had formed with like a stock company and like had money and kind of intended to, you know, compete as best they could. Uh, whereas uh, Kansas City kind of just formed out of nothing. Um, yeah, and so Milwaukee plays only home game, and St. Paul only plays road games. And so St. Paul has this distinction of being the only major league club to never play a home game. And so they end up playing nine games on the road, and that completes the season. Um, I should bring up, uh, just for the Virginia connection, um, the Union Association clubs played virtually no games against outside clubs because almost every club in the country had been prohibited from playing the Union Association under threat that they might get blacklisted or threat that they might not be able to play exhibition games against other clubs, which was a huge source of revenue for these clubs. Um, and so essentially there's only one club in the country that plays regularly against the Union Association. It's the Portsmouth Athletic Association, which is based out of Norfolk, uh, Portsmouth region. Um, and so, yeah, for whatever reason, they're willing to play Union Association clubs. They end up playing nine games against UA clubs. Um, they go one and eight, and they're outscored 92 to 29. Um, and the one victory came against Baltimore. And that game was a, a played under, um, I guess, contentious, uh, contentious uh, situation where essentially Baltimore won the game in extra innings. And then after the fact, Portsmouth claimed that the official score got the score wrong and actually Portsmouth was leading after nine innings so they actually should have won the game and so locally Portsmouth is saying they won the game and then Baltimore is saying that we won the game and it's just kind of like a silly situation but it gives you a sense of where the UA is on the pecking order um, against you know all these sort of things isn't that they, they're um, yeah probably weaker than the, the two major leagues they're probably sort of on par with uh, or a bit better than the Northwestern League, and then they're much better than these like semi pro clubs and things like that. And so, coming to a close, uh, the season sort of uh, ends with uh, St. Louis easily taking the pennant. They went 94 19. 
they were an exceptional club for this for the for the year. I think they still have to hold the record for the highest winning percentage for the major league club. Um, Cincinnati finished the season in second place with a 69 and 36 record. But in mid in early August, they had signed uh, Jack Glasscock and Jim McCormick, who were two excellent players who should be in the Hall of Fame uh, from Cleveland um, in the National League. And from that point on, they're, they're one of the strongest clubs in the league. And, and by the end of the season, they're probably on par with uh, St. Louis. Um, and in, actually, after the season, they end up playing an exhibition trade against the Louisville Colonels of the American Association. Um, and both St. Louis and Cincinnati, they split the series with Louisville. And Louisville had finished in third place in the American Association. It was quite a strong club. So you just sense, like, at the end of 1884, like, Cincinnati and St. Louis are pretty quite strong and probably could hold their own with some of the sort of middle-tier middle, middle tier clubs in the AA at the very least. And then Milwaukee also finished very strong. They went eight and four. They drew well. And then they also had a three-man rotation, which was very unusual for the time. Uh, and, yeah, they were quite dominant, like... If you look at the strikeout, this guy's striking out 15 guys a game and stuff. Uh, Ed Cushman, who is probably the best pitcher, he, in his first start, he pitched a no-hitter. And then in his second start, he pitched uh, eight no-hit innings and gave up a hit in the ninth inning. So he almost did the Johnny Vandermeer thing, you know, well before Johnny Vandermeer did. And then um, Baltimore and Boston also finished it by 500. But uh, the Union Association, as you know, did not last past 1884. And the reason why... Um, is that in spite of the fact that they were planning to take the field in 1885, um, and they were planning to do so as a Western League, which would have sort of saved money in terms of less travel, all that sort of stuff, because a bunch of the Eastern League's clubs had withdrawn from the league. Um, essentially, the, the plan would be, it'd be a Western League uh, in 1885. Um, so they were in discussions. Henry Lucas was heavily involved in those discussions. He was still attending meetings. But at the same time, he's also meeting with the National League about the possibility of moving uh, his St. Louis club to the National League to replace the Cleveland franchise, which um, had been decimated by the Union Association and um, essentially created an opening in the National League, which is sort of the thing that Lucas had kind of wanted all along. He really wanted to put a team in the National League if he could. And then once he sort of double crosses the league, he joins the National League, and that sort of kills the Union Association. Although a Western League, um, a Western minor league that will be affiliated with Major League, will, will be affiliated with organized baseball, forms kind of the ashes of the Union Association. Um, and for 1886, we still have four teams that, um, so for 1885, we have four teams in the Union Association that take the field in 1885. So St. Louis joins the National League, Washington joins the Eastern League, uh, and Kansas City and Milwaukee joined the Western League. And um, Washington actually wins the pennant in the Eastern League and is invited to join the National League. And Kansas City um, joins the National League as well in 1886. Although, uh, yeah, both those teams sort of struggle uh, in uh, in the National League. I think they finished sixth, seventh, and eighth place in 1886. And so, um, but essentially, you have three unit association teams that end up in the National League. And so then that brings us to a final question, which I get the most often is, is it a major league? Um, because I, I'm sure um, many Sabre members have read Bill James, and he has this uh, really potent essay in the uh, new, Jam new Bill James historical abstract from, I think, 2001, um, where he just sort of like really does his best to debunk the, the statistically that the Union Association should not be a major league, not be considered as such, and it's a mistake to consider as such because many of the players who had the best years in the Union Association um, either were not able to play regularly in the other major leagues or um, saw their performance fall off shortly um, from one league to another. And I think statistically, there's, there's a very strong and reasonable case to be made that the weakest major league, save for the early seasons of the National Association, which I know it's not considered a uh, uh, major league, um, but I, I, I'm a National Association trooper, so I think it should count personally. Um, but yeah, the Union Association is probably the weakest major league state for that. Um, it has no real legacy. Like you have Kansas City's first team, um, you have a record number of California players, and then you can also say that it sort of triggered the first sort of step in like the 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 battle um, between players and owners and the reserve rule, which would come to dominate baseball um, and sort of lead to the creation of the Players League and all sorts of labor strife that kind of continued on into Code Flood. And even to nowadays, you, like a lot of this stuff was has been going on for a long time in terms of 
players for no reason. And Union Association was kind of like one of the first real strong salvos in that battle because the Union Association was staunchly pro-player in terms of um, it was opposed to the reserve clause and was determined to give uh, players opportunities in spite of that. And Lucas, um, for all his faults, he was always staunchly in favor of his players. And so when he joins the National League and most of his players are blacklisted, he advocates on their behalf and says they should be allowed in. He says, um, if you're gonna let me in and I'm the cause of all this, like why aren't you letting the players back in? And so eventually he runs out and the players are reinstated, but he he remains steadfast in support of them. Um, and it's also considered, important to consider the context of 1884. Um, essentially organized baseball saw the UA as an issue you can say it was a nuisance, you could say it was a threat, and they did their best to undermine and kill it. So essentially, they tried to avoid it during the season, before the season, and then after the season, when they had the chance to take Henry Lucas in, they did. And they sort of, you know, were determined to put it out, put, put the issue to bed. And so if it's not a major league and you don't want to consider a major league, you have to consider, like, then why did this happen? Because, um, you know, any other league that has been seen as a threat by the established major leagues, has earned that major league status. So you have the Players League and later on the Federal League um, and even the American League, you know, they they went to war with National League. And so essentially this is like a context. If a league forms and joins and tries to rival the major leagues, um, typically it's earned that major league status. And so um, I think it's reasonable to consider it a major league as such. And then finally, the historical tradition of just how the league's been perceived um, by some of the key figures in baseball research and baseball history um, is, you know, the U.S. Association has always had that status. So Al Spink, who um, was a St. Louis native, uh, he founded the Sporting News, and he later claimed to have worked as a, a secretary for Henry Lucas in 1884. Uh, he wrote one of the first baseball history books in 1910 called The National Game. This sort of chronicles baseball's history, and he gives a lot of attention to the Union Association, in particular the St. Louis Club. He includes photos of the club. He talks about the club at length. And he sort of is viewing it in the same pantheon as like other great 19th century clubs. And so he sort of gives the Union Association credit as a major league. And then his disciple was a guy called Ernest Lanigan, who um, was also, had grown up in St. Louis and was familiar with the Union Association. And he invented the OBI and he's a very respected figure and later became the official historian for the Baseball Hall of Fame. And in 1922, he wrote the first baseball encyclopedia called the Baseball Encyclopedia. And he also gives credit to the Union Association in that book. Um, as a major league, he treats like the pennant as like equal to other pennants won by the St. Louis franchises. Um, and so he's given it credit. And he helped disciple Molly Allen, who uh, became the official historian of the baseball hall of fame as well. And um, also sort of, so you have this tradition. And then when the McMillan Encyclopedia in 1969 comes out, it sort of codifies and officially defines what a major league is, gives status to seven different major leagues, I believe. And the Union Association is one of them. And Molly Allen is heavily involved in that process. And so essentially from 1910, at least to 1969, it's been treated as a major league. And 1969 to present, it's been treated as such. And so I see no reason to like take away the status because, well, it's the history says it's just been treated as such for so long that, you know, there's no real point to change it, I don't think. So that concludes uh, the presentation. Um, I have a book out called Baseball's Union Association. It came out a couple months ago. Um, it's available at McFarland Books, but also wherever books are sold. There's also an ebook available as well, um, which is probably a bit more, it's a bit cheaper in price. And so if that's of interest, feel free to check it out. Um, I'm active on Twitter and uh, you can email me as well. And I'm now happy to uh, take any questions or comments or anything. All right, Justin, the, is the differentiation between minor leagues and major leagues back then, did it exist at the time or is it only something that we have placed upon them through the retrospect scope of history? So the term major and minor league doesn't actually appear until 1887. Like I've, I've Googled like in the newspapers.com and you see like, and that's the first time it appears. And so, before that, um, it's pretty clear that the NL and the AA are the two strongest leagues in the country. That's not really debated. Um, and then other leagues form, and they're sort of also trying to operate on their own. There's not like um, there's not like a farm system, so to speak. Right. Um, teams will sign players, but like as as you saw, the Northwestern League's part of that agreement, and so they're not getting poached by like major league clubs, like except for the Union Associations trying to. But when teams disband, then those players are free agents and they sign with clubs. But um, yeah, there's yeah. not like this 
it's not nearly as stratified as it later becomes where like there's clearly a major leagues and there's clearly a minor leagues it's it's not at that point so so basically the union association tried to become a, a major league a league equivalent to the yeah, American yeah, association, yeah. but they failed yeah pretty much yeah like and, and yeah, history they, said you know looking back and history, we may consider them a major league only because they tried to be a major league. Yeah. I think and that's, they that's did really actually good. maybe have better quality of play than some of the other, quote, minor leagues. Yeah, I, I would say they're stronger than the Northwestern League in 1984. Um, and it's also like a lot of the issues that people point out is like, well, like they didn't have major league talent and all that sort of stuff. But if you look at, I've, I've, I spent a lot of time thinking about this question, but um, in 1882, when the American Association formed, they had, I think, one or two players who had been regulars in 1881 in the National League, like almost all their players were not <laughs> in like the National League. And they, so they, they're taking everyone else. Mm -hmm. And so should the ATA2 American Association, should that be a major league? Like, it's like, you can, you can pick nits a bit. And then yeah. if you point out like, oh, the schedule is like uneven and tumultuous and like too many teams disbanded, but like the 1876 National League, New York and Philadelphia both dropped out of the league like late in the season. And so it's like, okay, well, is that a major league season and all that sort of stuff? So you can sort of pick nits, but I think what you're saying is that they were trying to be a major league. They were actually trying to compete with, with um, the two big leagues, especially. And so for that, yeah, I think they were, they, they were attempting it for the least. Yeah. Essentially they were a step in the evolution of professional baseball 100 yeah, a, yeah a step that led eventually to where we are now yep definitely yeah and i think the players league is it's sort of like the stronger iteration of what that might yeah. look like yeah. if they had like blasted or um that sort of thing okay hey justin uh, thank you that was a great presentation my pleasure um maybe it's a is it maybe it's the cross-pollination of these players across different leagues that also yeah makes it look like major leagues um, because it's not the the, the 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 fleeting up that we look at as the minor league. Yeah, yeah. But if they're cross-pollinating, yeah. these players are playing in these different leagues and they're ostensibly Hall of Famers, well, then they played in a major league. Yeah, yeah. And and it's important to note, like, so, like, someone like Milwaukee, like, they have one of the highest salaries in baseball and they're a minor league team. Like, you know, they like, there's not nearly the like players are not necessarily looking at I need to play in the National League or the American Association to be validated. They're looking who's paying the highest salary. And so if a team's willing to pay you three thousand dollars to play in the like no no Western League, you would take that if that was more than like you know whatever you got from wherever else. So, mm -hmm. you know, it was it was less stratified. It's a bit like with the the Pacific Coast League. I know um, for a long time in the 1910s and 20s, they kept a lot of players in California because, well, they paid better. These uh, California natives, they play close to home and they pay as well or better as the major leagues. And so why go play in Boston or something, you know, like, so it's a bit of that same sort of thing going on. Like it's, it's not nearly as stratified. Yeah. The Pacific Coast League historians, you know, go by Pacific Coast League as being a major league. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think there's a re very reasonable case to be made that they're, they're, at least some of the seasons should be given that credit. I got a question, Justin. Uh, yes. It's actually two questions. Uh, one, did the league, the union, have any different rules? Because I know rules for the game are a little loose. And yeah. two, can you tell me some of the nicknames? I always get a kick out of 19th century oh. nicknames. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, yeah, so in terms of rule changes, um, they didn't have any super distinct rules. 1884 was the first season where like, um, some of the leagues have it legal to throw overhand. Like, and um, union association is not that but they're they are pretty lenient about it so tommy bond who starts the season he goes like, like 12 and 1 and then fishes 12 9 and then he gets released like he a big part of his resurgence is that he's able to throw kind of like in this way where he's thrown a bit overhand and no one's calling him for it and so he gets this extra little advantage so there's that but there's not a bunch of distinct rule changes like other the main thing is just that they they got the reserve rule and like that leads to the reserve rule being strengthened by the rest of major league baseball um to like become more of a penalty, like where you can blacklist players, you're threatening players, you're using it as a tool to like keep players in check. And that's sort of the biggest kind of rule change that sort of happens as a result of the union association. But the, the playing rules are pretty similar to progressive major league baseball, progressive organized baseball. And then as for nicknames, I mean, Fred Dunlap, he's called Show Shot because he was, uh, he had a really accurate thrown on. Um, there is uh, Billy Taylor, who comes uh, from my favorite I really meant team names. Oh, teammates. Oh, sure. Sorry. 
Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. Um, so the first thing you need to know is that you all the names you see, or almost all of them, are, are wrong. Like they're not. Almost every team is just called the unions. Like it's pretty boring. Uh, so <laughs> you see, like in oh, it's the Phil the Pittsburgh Smokies. It's like that's not a thing. They're just not a thing at that time. Or I think I don't know where those names come from. They're just after the fact. So almost all the teams are called the unions. You have the Philadelphia Keystones, which are actually called the Keystones, and the Washington Nationals, or the Washington Nationals, but almost every other club are called the unions. The St. Louis club gets called the Maroons, and then later when they join the National League, they get called the Black Diamonds because they have so many blacklist, formerly blacklisted players on their roster, and they actually have like a uniform that has three Black Diamonds on it. Um, and I think that's kind of neat. Uh, but yeah, the Union Association itself, like the, there's, the nicknames are pretty boring. It's just like, they love Pittsburgh unions. And then right in the book, it became kind of tedious to just keep calling every team the unions, but I want to reflect reality as best as possible. And Justin, how did you get interested in researching the union league? Yeah, sure. Um, so it sort of starts, it's very connected to Sabre. Um, when I first joined Sabre, I got involved pretty quickly with the pictorial history committee. And they have a program where the trying to find photos of every single major league player uh, back to 1871. Um, and so I got really involved with that and built up all these case files and discovered, oh, there's 200 plus guys in the Union Association who don't have photos for it. And I just had started learning about these players and trying to track them down and learn how the league worked. Um, and I also got involved with the, the biographical committee doing the same kind of stuff, trying to track down these very obscure players like who, hey, only a last name in the, in the box score. And that's all we know about them. And, that sort of thing. And so I got involved with those two groups and they're very nurturing and very supportive. Um, uh, and so just built up all this knowledge of like 19th century baseball in particular, just through that. And then the Union Association became kind of a big fascination for me, particularly Washington Nationals. They have like, they, they, they had 51 players play for them. I think like 17 of them, we didn't have photos for. Nine of them don't have folks' names. Like another eight, like don't have birth death dates. So they became like this fascination for me. like why is this team the way it is? And then discovering all the resources that were available to make to do all this research and then started collecting box scores. And then I discovered the Union Association, no one had written a book on it, which was very surprising to me because in baseball, like someone's written a book on every subject. Um, so I'm like, okay, well, there's an opportunity there. And then um, I became friends with Peter Morris, who's a wonderful writer and heavily involved with the biographical research committee. So I just asked him like, well, how do you write a book? And then he, explained a bit of the process and then put me in touch with the pub his publisher and kind of got the ball going from there. So I, so I, this all happened around like like 2019. I wrote the book during the book of the first year of the pandemic and then kind of, yeah, yeah, eventually it just came out. So I mean, you, you had years of research though that led to that. Yeah, right? yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, the research. Yeah. yeah. And I love researching. Writing's much more of a less less joyful for me, but uh, it's a necessary output for Right. Um, interesting. But yeah, I'm happy you've done it. And uh, yeah, you could have done it without Sabre and without, uh, well, maybe not yourselves because I don't know y'all very well, but uh, <laughs> collectively, like Sabre people had a big impact on this book. So I'm yeah, the or book. organization so, like, has a innumerable, innumerable people that can help in many different topics. It's, oh, it's yeah. amazing. Yeah, it's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you. That was a uh, that was very very good and very uh, educational. I I knew nothing about the Union League. I, I I didn't even know there was a Washington Nationals there, and, and uh, yeah, yeah. so that was that was interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, yeah. And thank if you. Anyone has any questions or wants to follow up with anything? Just get in touch. I'm happy to answer anything Union related or whatever. So. All right. See you. See you around, Saber. Thank right. you. Sounds good. Thanks so much. See you. All right, Mr. Bourne, it's up to it's it's to you. All right. Did you make me the host? I did. You can share away. Okay, got it. Host disabled participant screen sharing says. Well, let me fix that. All right. Let's see. Make co-host. Yes. Okay. There you it says go. you're a co-host. We're in. All right. All right, let me make this full screen. Second here. It, it's full screen for me. There you go. All right. Um, I'm gonna talk about 
Can you see me? First of all, everybody hear me? Yes. Um, I'm going to talk about baseball in the 1960s. Um, I'm not the guy that's batting. That's Hank Aaron. And uh, I teach courses uh, through the Osher Lifelong Institute in William and Mary. Um, there's dozens of these across the country at all universities, and they're basically an opportunity for people our age to, or at least my age, to teach to others of their age and topics run anything from poetry to economics to physics. So <clears throat> I cornered the baseball market and the music history market. Those are the two course areas that I teach. And I'm gonna talk to you about baseball in the 60s because it's in my strike zone. Um, I probably have a card from every one of these years here. Uh, so we're gonna go through this. And uh, when I do this course, it's six weeks, two hours of class, 12 hours total of contact. And it's broken into six sessions. And I, um, as you see, it's mostly year driven. And then there are topics that come up expansion, owners, managers, diversity, uh, labor issues that I tug in there. I always try to cover a World Series <clears throat> and some seasonal highlights. But we're going to talk about this top area here, which is uh, a quick overview of the 60s, which takes about a half an hour. Uh, and then after that, we're going to yak it up, talk, or go to the general discussion um, of hot stove, if you want. Um, and I'm going to break this down into three areas, uh, baseball in the 60s, the teams, the best players, and then the trends. Okay. So let's open up with the teams. And you see, I picked these photos because each one of these people in there, they won um, a World Series, the Dodgers versus the Yankees here. You see Yogi in his last at bat in the World Series, uh, the Cardinals and the Tigers, and Tim McIver, who just passed away behind home plate there. That's Cal Al Kaline that's batting. The best team in the 60s. Well, that's an open question. First of all, it wasn't Major League Baseball. It was the Major Leagues, two separate fiefdoms. Um, and so you have to look at them independently when you do some analysis here. The Orioles had the best winning record in the American League and the Giants in the National League. Uh, on pure championships, it was the Yankees, two World Series, five pennants. The National League, the Cardinals, Dodgers, both had two World Series and three pennants. And uh, I guess you would say the bridesmaid of the group was the White Sox, who had the best, or the, you know, the White Sox had the best winning percentage without doing anything, without winning anything. And the luckiest team is undoubtedly the Mets, who won a World Series with a 376 winning percentage for the decade. Want to check out your team? Go ahead. Um, this is the World Series by year. Uh, each has their own story. Each is dramatic. Uh, the Pirates beat the Yankees in 1960, even though the Yankees outscored them two to one. And Bobby Ripperson. Richardson was MVP for a losing team, mostly because the vote for the MVP took place in the seventh or eighth inning of game seven before Mazeroski came to bat. In 61, the Yankees dominated over the Reds. Whitey Ford broke Babe Ruth's uh, shutout streak in the World Series, the same year that Roger Maris broke his home run record, as Whitey said, it was a bad year for the Babe. In 62, a uh, dramatic game, uh, went down to the final out, the Yankees won. Ralph Terry was the MVP. And ironically, he was the guy that pitched the ball that Mazeroski clubbed out of here in, in 1960. 63 was the uh, debut of Sandy Koufax on the national stage. Uh, and he and the rest of the Dodgers dominated the Yankees. The Dodgers only used four pitchers in that game, uh, in that series, excuse me. And uh, the Yankees... Always thought they were going to win, even up to the last out. Didn't come true. 64, of course, Gibson uh, took his turn on the stage and dominated the Yankees, 31 strikeouts. In 65, a very competitive series. Uh, once again, Koufax was the difference. Uh, 24 innings pitched and in, in less than one run given up, or one run given up. Um, 66 is the most one-sided World Series in history, I think. The Orioles uh, dominated the Dodgers. The Dodgers had two runs in the entire 
four game series. The Orioles used uh, four pitchers. The Orioles were never behind. Uh, the Dodgers had a batting average of about 150 that series. In 67, a uh, great showdown between the Cardinals and the, and the Red Sox and Gibson was the difference, uh, in, particularly in game seven, uh, where he went on two days rest and won the game while Jim Lomberg went on two games rest and couldn't last. 68, everybody thought it was gonna be a showdown between Gibson and Danny McClain. Instead, uh, Mickey Lolich dominated the series. And in 69, the Miracle Mets, and to this day, I can't figure out how they beat such a good team like the Baltimore Orioles. Let's talk about uh, the players, and we'll go through Hall of Fame players first from that era. The best hitters, pitchers, runners, and defenders, um, which are kind of the best of the best, and then trends. And we're gonna kick off with the Hall of Fame players. This is Jim Bunning with his famous sidearm motion. If I had another spot, he would be falling off to the mound to the first base side. So in this decade, 55 players played who made it to the Hall of Fame. And I've broken this chart out. So you read it across, so you see there are 20 pitchers, three catchers, and so forth. And if you come down these columns, it tells you where their primary uh, time of playing was, when their best years were. So uh, you'll see once again, as almost always, outfielders and pitchers dominate, middle infielders and catchers come up short. Actually, second base does pretty well this time. Third base comes up short. Let's see what we got here. For the guys who played before 19, the best years before 1960, I counted 16. And this is based primarily on their war, wins above replacement. Uh, stats. And some may surprise you, like uh, White Ford and Mickey Mantle or Ernie Banks were kind of on the edge there, but their best years were in the 50s. Everybody else, I mean, Duke Snyder, Red Shandies, you're going to immediately say, yeah, that's a 50s guy. Should add one more. Come on. uh, um, you got 22 Hall of Fame inductees who played in the 60s, and this is the core years. And if you look at this, you say, oh yeah. I mean, those are, those are 60 guys. Oof, look at them. And every one of these guys, um, well, I would, shouldn't say all of them. Just recently, Oliva was uh, added and Jim Cott was added. But most of these guys have been in for a little bit now in the Hall of Fame. And these 17 guys started in the 60s, but really were known as uh, 70 players or 80s. The awards, um, three, two MVP awards each for Robinson and Maris, batting average champ Clemente four times, triple crown winners Robinson and Yastrzemski in 66 and 67 respectively. All-star games, there were 13 played in this uh, decade, uh, 60, 61, and 62. They had two a year because 60% of the funds from each All-Star Game and World Series went into the pension fund. Gold gloves, Robinson had 10 Cy Young Awards, Koufax three, pitching triple crowns, which is wins, strikeouts, ERA, Sandy Koufax won in 63, 65, and 66. Let's talk about the best hitters of the 60s. There's one, Mickey. I highlighted two players because they won most of the, the categories here. Clemente was perhaps the best pure hitter, uh, batting average, hits, triples, uh, while Henry Aaron was arguably the best slugger, although Frank Robinson stands out there for on-base plus slugging. Uh, Mickey Mantle had the highest on-base percentage. Maury Wells, of course, steals. Uh, kind of curious if Willie Mays didn't win any of these categories. If you were to pick a team in 1960 and play with them for the decade, this would be your decade team from offense. Now, this is based on a full season or 162 game season as we do now. So if you look across Joe Torrey there, he played 7.5 years. He didn't play much in the first two years, but then he was a regular after that. And that shows his average on a 162 game season, how many home runs, RBIs, slugging, 
and what his war would be. And what you get are four, five different winners here. Clemente was the best hitter. Killebrew edged out um, Willie McCovey at first base. Hank Aaron drove in the most runs. Robinson had the best on base plus slugging. And Willie's Mays had the best war. You look at Ron Santo there. I was mildly surprised he did so well and why it took so long for him to get into the Hall of Fame. Um, he had better stats than Robinson. Dick Allen was very close to him in stats, offensive stats. Um, Ken Boyer did pretty well too. This is just a list of home run hitters in the 60s. And you take Kellebrew across the top. And in the 60s, he hit 393 of his 573 home runs, which means about 69 of his career home runs showed up in the 60s. In his best single year of 49, in two years, actually, he repeated it. Now I'll let you look through this. It's not surprising, the first five. Then you get Frank Howard and Norm Cash, um, who, core part of their years, uh, were in the 60s. So they produced over uh, about three quarters of their home runs during the 60s. Now I included Roger Maris in there at the bottom because a lot of people might say that Roger Maris deserves belongs in the Hall of Fame, but you look at that, he finished 14th in the decade, and that was 79% of his home runs. Let's turn to the pitchers. There's 31 game winner and bad boy, Denny McClain. I highlighted two pitchers here. You had Juan Marichaud who had the most wins, the most complete games. If you look carefully, you'll see Marichal had more complete games than wins and then shutouts. Well, Sandy had the ERA, strikeouts per nine innings, the, the whip category, and the Cy Youngs. Drysdale, Gibson, and Wilhelm show up here. Now, I'm going to use an analogy because these are very different pitchers from the perspective of the batters and, and the way the fans even treated them, and perhaps even history. I'm going to use an analogy of the other courses that I teach around music. Suppose these were piano players, if you will. Yeah, who would they represent? Now, you got Wilhelm, who threw the knuckleball and was kind of a specialist. I would say he's kind of like a jazz pianist, like uh, Theodore Monk or something like that. Um, and then you've got uh, Marishaw, who threw five different pitches from three different arm angles. He could do just about anything on the mound. Uh, and very stylish, always happy. So kind of reach out and say, he's like Oscar Peterson. He can play classical and jazz and pop and uh, just about any type of music and everybody enjoyed it. Then you got the Drysdale and Gibson hardball throwers. They kind of reminded me of uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, just playing rock and roll at its hardest. And Koufax, Everybody admired, respected, revered, probably is the right word for Koufax. He's like Vladimir Horowitz, the great piano, concert piano player. This goes and does a 162 game season, really it's 160 innings, uh, for the three best right-handers and the three best left-handers. And you'll see that Sandy dominated um, all the categories here, um, except for wins and losses. And uh, it's also quite clear that the right headers were the dominant force here during this time period with the exception of Sandy, because if you look at the second or third choices, uh, Ford and Spawn did well in the first years, but they faded and nobody really stepped in to take their spot among the lefties. Let's talk about the best defenders. From simply gold gloves, um, Brooks Robinson won every one every year. Mays and Clemente had nine. Kayline Cott and uh, who else? Bill White had eight. Mazeroski had seven. Aparicio, six. And Freehand had five. Well, we know that gold gloves are 
nowadays are much more analytical driven as opposed to back then it was uh, more observation and just judgment. Let's look at defensive war leaders by year. With Robinson getting the most for the decade, you'll see that each year you've got different names. You have Apparition and Robinson show up, and you have other people like Boyer, Hansen, Brinkman, and Alley, uh, who were defenders, pure and simple, and occasionally got hits. Hansen did pretty well, and Clayton had a few good years, but they were there mostly for their defense. And so if you were say go gloves are always tainted by the offensive capabilities of that position player, I think you'd right. Wins above replacement leaders uh, by position players. Yastrzemski had the best season in 1967. Average war per year, Willie Mays, 8.4, which came out for an 84 total for the decade. Among the pitchers, Gibson had the best year in 1968. His average war per year for Sandy Kopex is 6.8. Like best cumulative war for decade is Juan Marshall, 55.3. Willie Mays uh, was the player of the decade. Um, he had, and bear in mind, he was age 28 when the decade started and he finished at 39. He still bat 300, had 350 home runs and over a thousand RBIs. Um, nine gold gloves, 13 all-stars, only one MVP. And some people think he should have had more. Um, and then he had all those war and home run championships. And he got all the war because he has the five tools. Uh, war is based on all five tools contributing. And he definitely had the best five tool combination of any player in the 60s. So let's talk overall hitting, pitching trends. Hitting trends first. This shows you the number of 300 hitters percentage wise per decade. So I went through and added up all the guys who had uh, the batting title requirements, which is 3.1 at bats, excuse me, 3.1 plate appearances per amount of times that the team played. So if you got 162 season, you need 504 plate appearances. If you got 154 season, you got uh, 444 plate appearance requirements. And then took all those and uh, compiled them all and then found the median number and found that on, a, on the median total, 12% um, of all the 1960 regulars, not all players, all the regulars were 300 hitters. Um, if you go back to the 1920s, 300 was no big deal, as you can see here. But it bottomed out in the 60s. And we've returned to that number in the 2020s. I didn't count 2021. So it's really, excuse me, I didn't count 2020, but I just added up 21 and 22 for that total. Okay. If you turn to home runs, this is the number of home runs divided by hits. Um, and for the decade, for the regulars. No, I, yeah. So for all, excuse me, for all number of hits uh, and all number of home runs per decade. So 9.2% of all the hits in the decade were home runs, which is fairly consistent with the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. And then the 90s, you started getting steroid late in the decade and started creeping up and up. And now everybody's going for the home run. Nothing to do with steroids, just the way we play now. If you're to overloot, Overlay those two charts, the number of 300 hitters and the number of home run for a bat. You'll see that it's really the 300 hitters that had the most dramatic changes. And it spiked in the steroid period, much to my surprise, and then came down. I also looked at what a regular player would be. Once again, you take all the guys who were qualified for the batting title, 504 at bats during 162 season, and you went through them all and what would be the, the middle number, the median of that, uh, excuse me, that's average. The middle number that comes up 
is 255 batting average for 1960 with six home runs, 33 RBIs, a 712 OPS, and a 3.82 ERA among the pitchers who qualify for the 160 innings. What this shows you is that 61 and 62 was the peak year for average hitters, not just great hitters, but the average hitters. And then started declining. You watch down here, it hits the bottom at 1968 with a 237 average. Six home runs, 34 RBIs, and the 2.98 ERA is a full one run less than 1961. And the drop off started after 1962. There's a half a run drop there. The drop off started when the strike zone was expanded from the armpits to the top of the shoulders, from the top of the knees to the bottom of the knees. So pitchers got what amounted to about an extra foot in a strike zone to work with. And I think it took a while for everybody to adjust to that. Umpires, batters, hitters, pitchers, um, to learn how to do that and how to take advantage of that. And it reached its peak in 1968. Base stealing trends. This is a busy chart, but the one you got to look at first is the, nut, the green. This is the, for a team average, team average, uh, per year. So in the 70s, average team got 100 steals. And they were caught 59 times out of 159 attempts, which is a success rate of 63%. Okay. So if you drop back to the 60s, the average team stole 67, got caught 40 times, 63%. And it's important to understand until Maury Wills came along, stealing just didn't happen. Maury changed everything. Uh, it was as dramatic an impact as Roger Maris's 61 home runs, uh, except he was taking on Ty Cobb, uh, a legend who had only just recently passed, and he was a black man. Uh, so there was a lot of hatred to Maury we've forgotten about. Uh, but he did it through studying batters before uh, videotape came into vogue and for stopwatch, excuse me, studying pitchers and catchers and getting the jump on people. Now, I think the peak in here was both cultural, people got used to stealing bases and adopted it as a primary offense, and the introduction of videotape where you can study pitchers and their moves and their time it took to come to home plate. And you'll see here the success rate slowly crept up. It's now 75%. You don't have as many steals because you go for home runs. You don't want to risk it out, but the success rate is higher. Okay. This shows pitching and it takes, uh, excuse me, shows home runs and stolen bases by comparison. And you'll see here in the 60s, you had a jump up in stolen bases Home runs stayed the same. In the 70s, the two were almost equal. Same for the 80s. And then the 90s kicked in with steroids. And although stolen bases seemed very similar, uh, the amount of home runs jumped up, jumped up and jumped up, and stealing has dropped off. Okay. 20s is the only time where there were most, more stolen bases than home runs. Pitching. The 20 game winners and the ERA less than three by season in the 60s. So those are kind of the two metrics of a good pitcher back then. Yeah, whether or not you won 20 games, whether or not your ERA was less than 3.0. And as you see, the number of 20 game winners as you go along are pretty much the same. Even with expansion, there's more pitchers and times to feast on weaker uh, teams. That's because you can only win so many games. You only get so many appearances and uh, your success rate is uh, relative to the number of appearances that you get to get you to 20. But the ERA can um, always be improved on and you may not win games. And what's interesting here is that after 62, ERA shot up from nine guys who had ERA less than three to 24. 
It leveled off for a while. And then 67, it started taking off again. In 68, there were 49 guys whose ERA was less than three and up. Okay. Let's look at 20 guys whose ERA was less than 2.5. 20 of them had less than ERA 2.5. As you look through here, there are five guys who made the Hall of Fame. And only one on the left side, Gibson. You got Driver, Drysdale, Seaver, Marischal, Perry on the right side. A lot of these guys, I call them average pitchers who had good years. Um, and some of them had losing records. Bob Veal over had a losing record. Nash had a 500 record. Orland had a losing record. Even with ERAs less than 2.5. We can come back to this if you want. I want to wrap it up by saying these are the interesting non-data oriented topics, although you can quantify a lot of this stuff, that you need to reflect on if you want to talk about further, uh, because they're very much part of the 60s expansion, the slow pace of diversity, the predominance of the National League over the AL, primarily because of uh, the National League's uh, acceptance of integration a lot more than the AL. Uh, home run speed and pitching kind of define as they do every decade, but the changes that occurred to it, as I said, it was the major leagues, not the MLB, and how they were two separate fiefdoms and how they approached things. Uh, television started injecting a lot of cash into the, uh, the system. Baseball fell behind football in terms of viewers and the beginning of the labor issues and the first collective bargaining agreement. So we could talk about that or we can talk about our favorite players, whatever you wanna do. I'm gonna turn the time back to you guys. And if you got a question or if you want to uh, just yak, let's do that. Paul, uh, um, with the spike in stolen bases in the eighties uh, compared, how much of that was related to AstroTurf? It had an impact because the balls scooted faster, not necessarily because they they were uh, steel guys, but because it was at that point speed was important. You hit the ball on the ground and you can run to first base, or you can get around. But the ball went through the gaps more. Uh, but it doesn't really impact your stealing that much. You might have better footing on Astro Tour relative to dirt. But I think it was more that it was the videotaping and that you could see the pickoff moves and how long it took and they started collecting data. Maury Wills succeeded 88% of the time in 1962, 88%. And that was because he studied pitchers and knew in his head how long it took and when he was likely to throw a curveball, and where, which direction to slide, all those different things. He wasn't the fastest guy in his own team. Um, Willie Davis was faster than him but he got a better jump because he understood when to go. And with respect to the, um, the difference in pitching in the late 60s, well, with the, you know, with the, with the decline after the, uh, the uh, strike zone was enlarged and so on, do you think that the difference, the return back more towards baseline from 68 to 69 was related to the lowering of the mound? You know, there's a lot made of the lowering mound because it's a physical thing. I think it was the reversal of strike back, strike zone back to the smaller okay. strike zone that had a bigger difference. Um, I'm not a pitcher. Drew, you can, any of you pitchers can join in on the, the height of the mound issue. Um, <laughs> but I, I think the idea that you had a full extra foot to work with and you, you lost it was more important than anything else. So, Paul, um, I was a huge uh, Dodger fan back in the early 60s and loved Maury Wills. Uh, certainly remember that 62 season and all. But, and uh, this, of course, the, the, the rankings of the players, of course, that uh, brings up uh, 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 one of the great things about baseball. You can argue all day long right. about uh, rankings and all. But you do have one slide there where you have uh i guess the players of the decade per position yeah. by position and laura maury wills is shortstop 
to me is still a surprise. Um, um, I know, I guess Banks wasn't included there because I guess he played first base probably more than short at that time. Yes. But uh, I think about uh, Aparicio and I'm, I'm trying to think of who else was out there. It just uh, surprises me that uh, Maury uh, gets that distinction out of all the shortstops in the 60s. Yeah, I was, I was pleasantly, I was surprised too. Um, and then the more I studied Wills, I started to understand why he was ranked, why he got a higher wins above replacement. Uh, Aparicio uh, was slightly on the decline. His, uh, his greatest years were in the 50s and early 60s, and then he kind of slipped a little bit. Uh, Maury was pretty much constant throughout the 60s. And if you, like I said, it's, it's kind of a cumulative uh, aspect of this. You got to play eight or nine good years in a row. Um, and he, Louis, Louis started to decline. Well, when the Orioles traded him back to the White Sox, he became kind of an average shortstop at that point. I think that was 67. Hmm. Yeah. Who else was playing short? I mean, uh, I mean, Louis is in the Hall of Fame, or he's not. And I'm just, who else? You, you mentioned Ron Hansen, I saw, but uh, there was, yeah, there was no Hall of Famer shortstop whose primary career was in the 60s. Mm. There were guys who started um, and then went on um, to that, uh, went back, so to speak. Uh, if you want to go prior in time, Arnie Banks in the 50s was a shortstop, and then he moved over to first base. Uh, but, you know, you had Gene Alley. Uh, you had, uh, excuse me? I guess Dick Grote, but he was more in the 50s, maybe. Well, Dick had uh, four good years uh, in the 60s, and then uh, I don't think he made it to 66. I have to go back and look. Hmm. Uh, but he was an MVP in 60 and then runner-up in 64, I think. Uh, it might have been 63. So he was uh, a very good defensive player as well as a good hitter, as uh, too. Well, yeah, Mark, Mark Belanger, right? Or down. Yeah. The I mean, the, the calendar, I think, I think your point, Paul, is the calendar mm -hmm. conspires against you in this one. Right. Because you got to have not, you got to have nine good years, but they're split between decades. In some yeah. Um, yeah the, it seems like the shortstop position, there weren't good young shortstops in the late 50s that, that had their prime years in the 60s. It's like they were. They, the, all the good shortstops were older in the, at the end of the 50s going into the 60s. So they, they kind of declined physically into the 60s. Right. Um, yeah, I think you're right, Frank. It's just a, a calendar thing. In the 70s, you have some great shortstops, but they're not offensive powerhouses. Right. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's, it's a little bit of a lot of things. It was an era when uh, middle infielders were defenders first. Um, and then, um, uh, if you got anything out of them from the bat, that's great. Um, yeah. it was only Ripken. The Hongmeyer, and, the, Hong, the Hongmeyer C that rivals Wills is wholly over Sai, And I, I, I don't know if, uh, I, I honestly might, I, I, I think I, I think I still go, I still go with more Wills because of his speed. Yeah, Maury was a good defender too. He got points for that. Um, he got on he base too. He really honest. set the yeah. he really set the table for the Dodgers. He well, got on base a lot. Well, he had to steal bases to get up. He had to get on bases to steal bases. <laughs> yeah, and speed is uh, the most disruptive thing. Um, I mean, home runs you shrug them off and you press on, but a speedster on a base drives you nuts and demoralizes the other team. Yeah. Yeah, Paul. Um, hey, you you bring your A game with these. You do a really nice job of just presenting it all. So Thank you. that is really that is really nice. I I really yeah. would like to head up to William and Mary and see you do this. Yeah. Um, the the as a mediocre pitcher, as I was, I, I think the 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 height of the mound issue. I think that was an issue, but I think that batters would have adapted 
over time. I mean, it was the, the transition year. Uh, I think that that contributed. I don't think that meant everything, um, but it did change a lot of the view, I guess, for batters, and they would have overcome that over time. The the thing about ERA though, so the sixty two change. I remember I remember the the number of pitchers increased dramatically in sixty two. Is that solely based on expansion? Uh, it, expansion, first of all. Expansion for the American League produced a bonanza of home runs. And, but in 62, when the National League expanded, it, it actually the batting averages just dropped and other stats dropped. Right. Uh, and 63 is when they introduced the bigger strike zone. And the argument for doing it, uh, Bill James thinks it was just a, a group of guys in a committee who didn't understand what they were doing. They, because the number, the stature of the people that made that decision. They recommended it back to restore the strike zone to what it was during the 20s and 30s and to, in their view, to reduce the amount of uh, home runs uh, to make it more balanced. The idea that the batters would have to swing early in the count or else they get picked off in the corners. Mm -hmm. um, and so they wanted to increase the pace of play, which was a horrible two hours and 15 minutes at that point. <laughs> uh, and they wanted to speed things up. That was their objective, but they got the reverse in that expanding the strike zone, uh, you got so much more to pitch to. As uh, Whitey Ford once said when he looked at Frank Howard, boy, I got an extra foot to play with that guy. Um, and, and so it took a while, I think, for pitchers to figure out how to pitch to the bigger strike zone, maybe for the umpires to adjust to it too. They talk a lot about the uh, high fastball um, in that era. And it, it's dangerous to pull off because, and I'm not a pitcher, but you know, you miss your high fastball, it's gonna go right belt high. Uh, you miss a low fastball and it goes in the dirt. It's a lot less harmless. Uh, I think the low fastball was probably more advantageous to more pitchers because they could play around with that extra six inches down there than it is up high. And you pitchers can chime in here. Yeah, I think as a as a batter, it's harder to hit a high fastball. Obviously, um, I mean any right any anything above your above your sternum, it's hard to get the bat to the ball at the angle you need to to make solid contact. Yeah. And if you think about the pitchers back in the '60s, there were there were a lot of hard throwers, right? And if if you if they could master that pitch, they they were hard to hit. So you think of Juan Marichal, Bob Gibson, um, Danny McClain, Mickey Lolich. I mean, Gaylord Perry actually was a hard thrower in the '60s relative to the era, right? He wouldn't not today he wouldn't be considered, but I mean, those guys all would pitch up in the zone, and then they could also break off a curveball that buckle your knees, right? So I, I think it was the combination of those two. So when you added that six inches or four inches up here to give them that that difference, right? And you added you added another three inches below the knees so that that variability in the two pitches were it was just hard for people to to hit that, especially the the, the really good pitchers. And Koufax is the greatest example of that, that high right. fastball that he threw and then <laughs> drop it off the table. And, uh, and my understanding is uh, with, with Koufax is that, uh, yeah, maybe, I don't know about the mound and, and, and uh, you know, raise it, but, but so much about the mound, but uh, I understand that in Los Angeles, Koufax's mound, mound was a little bit higher than a lot, some of these other mounds. So he had a, you know, expanded strike zone, you know, a huge fastball and curveball and a higher mound. And that, a lot of people point that out. Yeah, another factor that kind of creeped in here is that you got a lot of new ballparks now with mm. standardized deep fences and a lot of foul toy because they were uh, multi-purpose stadiums, um, right. many of them. Uh, a few were home run havens like uh, Atlanta, but most of them were like Dodger Stadium in Oakland and that sort of stuff where you, foul balls were death there. Right. And that, that really exacerbated in the 70s when everybody built the ashtrays, right? Yeah. Um, you, had, you had foul territory everywhere. 
How many people are coming to your uh, class over at William and Mary? I, I don't know. Uh, I checked the. I don't know at the start of the semester, and it's a rolling admission. I had about sixty-eight at the time. Wow! So there's it. It probably can get up to seventy-five or eighty, something like that. Is it in person? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Good. Great. Yeah. Nice job. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Very cool. Well, how, what? Uh, how many hours have you put into that? I mean, that that was very that, that was very well done. My, I like the I like the way you present the the ratios of you know A to B. I don't know if my <laughs> brain would. No, I did. I, I don't know if my brain would think of it that way. But when you see it, it's it's very well very well uh, presented. Um. I just spent too damn long on it, to be honest about you. <laughs> that um, you saying that or your spouse saying no, that? No, I'm admitting that. You know, <laughs> sometimes I get obsessed with it. I bet off probably more than I could chew by saying I'm going to do all the 60s at once. Yeah. Uh, and uh, what I like to do is do my own research as much as possible. Um, and then, then go out and find other people with different points of views. And then I collect a lot of stories because my audience is not as saber analytical as this one here. It's usually people, um, most of them played baseball, understand baseball, but every once in a while, I remember one woman in the front row turned to her husband and said, what does ERA stand for again? Mm -hmm. So you, you really, you can't get too lost in the data without entertaining them every once in a while. Right. Uh, and I love stories about baseball. I mean, uh, you probably have heard this, stop me if you heard this, but uh, Mickey Mantle's uh, 535th home run was off of Danny McClain at Tiger Stadium, his last at bat and the last appearance. And when he went around the bases, McClain took off his glove and applauded and all the Tigers went on the top step and applauded because he had passed Jimmy Fox. But the real story is, that McLean called his pitcher, Jim, a catcher, Jim Price out and said to him halfway between the, the mound and the home plate, hey, let's let Mickey hit one. Because he knew it was his last at bat at Tiger Stadium and he had to break Jimmy Fox's record. So he went back to home plate and Mickey saw him talking. He just said, what were you guys talking about? And Price turned to him and says, McLean wants to give you a cookie, which is slang for a home run. And the first pitch was right down the middle and Mickey took it because he didn't believe Price. And McClain kind of shrugged his shoulders like, what do you want? What do you want, you know? And he threw the next one and he fouled it just to the right of the foul pole. And um, Price turned and says, what do you really want? He says, I'd like uh, high and tight medium cheese, please. And so he put it right there and boom, 440 feet it went. And uh, round of the bases and everybody applauded. And the next guy up was Joe Pepitone, who had heard all this from the on back deck circle. And he says, I'd like a cookie, please, too. <laughs> and Price said, who do you think you are, Mickey Mantle? And so the first pitch knocked Pepitone on his butt and uh, <laughs> went on with the game. Yeah. So those kind of stories I love telling. Well, that, that, was, uh, that was well done. Well done. Um, just as a uh, um, a marketing pitch, uh, the twenty third. I don't know if anybody has read any of Andy McHugh's books. I I just finished reading his stumbling around the bases about expansion. Very easy read. Very well done. Um, things I I didn't know about a lot of the owners. So I I'm really looking forward to having Andy uh, in March. I think that's going to be very uh, very educational. At least it was for me because when you're you know, I, I was in the, I was my, my single digits going into my teenage years into the seventies. And so you don't think about baseball ownership when you're, when you're watching baseball as a kid. And that was very, it was very interesting to learn about the, uh, the different owners. And like you said, Paul, it was um, American league and national league back then it wasn't major league baseball. So the, uh, the, the dichotomy between the two leagues and how, structured thinking the National League used versus just winging it from the American League was really, it was eye-opening to me that I, I I never appreciated growing up as a kid. So I think that's going to be a, a really interesting um, 
topic with Andy. Andy's a very uh, he's a very fun speaker, so I think that's going to be really good. I'm looking forward to that. So, so if you guys haven't read that, um, I would I would highly recommend it. Um, next week, for those of you who want to either come through the tunnel or are, are already on this side of the tunnel, VMI plays at ODU. Uh, it looks like the weather's going to be good for that for that day on Tuesday. So uh, I plan on on going to the game. Uh, my nephew's the first base coach for VMI, and actually, the the former head coach of VMI is now an assistant at ODU this year. So. Um, mm -hmm. It, it's uh, interest. It's always an interesting game to watch. Uh, watch them play. So uh, I'm going to be there. So if anybody would like to join us, I don't know Frank if you're going to be able to get out of work and, and join us or not. Oh, I, I plan on being there. Matter of fact, I'm heading to the the to the Bud right now to see them play St. John's. But I'll be I'll see you on Tuesday. Yeah, v, VMI's getting their head handed to them by uh, Mississippi State this weekend. So. Oh, it's okay. So ODU is in a bad. Uh, the they're in a tough spot this year. Uh, yeah. They lost uh, out of the the roster. They lost the majority of the roster. I think um, in today's pilot, they were talking about that. I did not realize that. Um, they've lost. I, they've lost three quarters of their team. And I. Oh, so it's a rebuilding year for ODU, huh? It's it's going to be. I think it's going to be rough. I saw some of the workouts. So. Yeah. We'll find out. So, and, uh, and so ODU, join us. And for ODU folks, as long as you, you had that commercial, um, you know, keeping an eye on the Kansas City Royals this year, considering with, with the Bud Matheny chapter, which is tied to Old Dominion, uh, Kansas City has Vinny Pasquantino starting at first. They signed Ryan Yarbrough, who pitched for ODU, and their manager is Matt Quattaro, who was an ODU alum as well. So, well, now they're the uh, Kansas City Dominions. That's exactly. I'm telling you, I'm keeping my eye on this one. <laughs> cool. Interesting. All right. Anybody else have any other uh, any other topics to discuss? One thing about the uh, the two books that that uh, that um, the our next speaker is going to wrote that he wrote about the the book that's about the move of the Dodgers to L.A. Walter O'Malley book. Yeah, the Walter O'Malley book. Is a make certain you start it early. It's a difficult read. It's a tough uh, all about the politics of Brooklyn and then the politics of LA. And you don't really talk. I'm I'm halfway through and there hasn't been much discussion at all about baseball yet. Right. Uh, okay. So I'm I, I mean it's interesting because it shows, I mean, what it's demonstrated to me is it shows that politics in the 50s and 60s. Is just was just as divided as politics, you know, presently. Maybe not quite, but close to it. What we so. what, what the what the book draws on, Ray, is is some earlier books written uh, written about the move. So I think that uh, McCo draws on those books, and for people like you who maybe haven't read those books, uh, that would be that would, would be a harder read. Yeah. Yeah. Ray, what? It, well, how thick is it? Is it a couple hundred pages, or it's, uh, it's about close to four hundred pages? Oh wow! Because the other book is like it's it's two hundred printed pages, but of that, about sixty of it are bibliographies and notes. Yeah. So it's only like one hundred and thirty pages. So it was really it was a fairly quick read. Yeah, this is a. Uh, I'm halfway through, and I think I'm page two twenty or something. But again. Uh, you know, a big share of the last half is his notes. Yeah. So it's 350 pages of reading. I mean, I'm I'm enjoying the book because I'm I've got a vested interest in this being born the year the Dodgers left. Oh, okay. So right. I was raised. You were the reason. I was raised to rate, hate Walter O'Malley. Okay. <laughs> so I've read a lot of the the other books about it, and um, it's a dense book. Yeah. And it's well researched. That's the yes. thing. I think you know. To Ryan's point, it's it's well researched, um, and it gets really dense. But as a New Yorker, knowing the characters of the, the of the piece, it's a great book. I'm, uh -huh. I'm excited about this. I've not looked at the expansion book yet. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to that. I hope he's going to talk a little bit about this. Yeah, I hope so. Well, he'll he's uh, he's very open to questions and stuff during the conversation. So uh, 
I think it'll be a, I think it'll be a pretty interesting conversation. Looking forward to it. All right. Anybody going to spring training? Hey, I'm excited. Right. When are you going? Uh, I'm going to be down there for two weeks, so I'm taking off tomorrow, and I'm going to catch at least one Nats game. Try to see if I recognize any of the players on this year's <laughs> Nats team. Right. Anyway. You know, normally you want to go early in the game so you see the, the stars before they depart, but I'd probably stick around the seventh inning to see the future. That's more interesting. Yeah, exactly. Or 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 go to the back fields, right? And watch yeah. the watch the young guys. Yeah. I wonder if they're gonna allow a lot of that. I mean, they use COVID as an excuse, obviously, to constrain everyone. Right. I, I'm wondering if that's really going to come back because the, the fun part is not the game. It's all of the wanderings and you know, through the whole complex. Um, I, I wonder if that's going to happen. So, Paul, you're going to do our intel on this one. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Okay. Now, where are the, the Nats again? Uh, the West Palm Beach, they okay. share a complex with the Astros. Oh, okay. Well, that, that Astros will be fun to watch too. A lot, uh, of, good, a lot of good uh, talent. Uh, to raise to raise, to raise question about about spring training, there is no there are no there are no health and safety protocols. So no, there aren't. Everything is back uh, to normal. Well, that's good. That's, that's good. good. I hope. Yeah, Paul, are you worried about uh, Steven Strasburg? I think that I his think career may be over. Yeah, I, I think, think he's, I think he's, I think he's done. done. Wow. Yeah. I've uh, read some of the medical reports that I could get. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think he's done too. Yeah. I was just floored that he's 34. Yeah. He still, it still seems like he should be like 28. Yeah, I know. <laughs> because he never pitches, That's right? I mean, we never like, seen him. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Wow. Uh, that's sad that he's such a talent too. Yeah. Well, that, that motion of his was, it was doomed to failure from the beginning. That was the risk of him from when he came out of school was his throwing motion. But, and Frank, what do you think you're, uh, don't you have a, a new Japanese or Korean pitcher? Senga? Uh, yeah. I'm forward to it. I mean, Senga's an established star. Um, he's really, um, he's pitched in a high profile team that has been a continual winner has pitched big games, 10 years experience. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, he could be the, the four starter on that team and he'll yeah. be successful. So I'm, I think Seng is a great pickup. A great and pickup. He's, he's what, Japan or Korea? Where'd he? Japan, uh, South, um, South Bank, uh, the South Bank Hawks. Okay. The South Bank Hawks in the, in the teens is played every Okay, so they're in the um, they're in the Pacific League. They beat every Central League team who came to the series. All the Central League teams at one time during that decade played, and they beat them. Right. The, the, he's a, he's a good pitcher. Hey, Paul, I didn't look at the schedule close enough. Are the Angels coming to? Uh, are they coming to Washington, Anaheim? <laughs> I don't know. I don't think so, but I, I don't know. I didn't look. I, I've, I've got to go see Otani pitch this year. I just, I've never seen him live. And he seems like he's, he's the player you want to tell your, you know, your grandkids. Yeah. I remember watching him when he was. And Mike Trout. Mike Trout's another yeah. one. Yeah. Well, Trout's, how old's Trout's like 32 now? I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, guys are getting older. We could go to Baltimore for that matter. Yeah. That's true. That's so, something to look at. The other look thing it up here. Is there any interest about seeing the Savannah Bananas? <laughs> the Savannah I'm, I'm Bananas. I've been intrigued by it. I've been intrigued by the, the whole Harlem Globetrotter-ish right. thing. Well, they, they played Savannah. I've been wanting to do it because my great uncle, I think, is still the same stadium they had in the 50s when he pitched in the minor leagues. And he pitched in 49, actually, he pitched for the Savannah Indians. So I've always kind of wanted to go there. So I've been following that team, and they're, they're pretty interesting team. They're, to, they're touring the country. So uh, they're not, uh, they're touring the country. So it's not really okay. a local thing necessarily anymore. 
Oh, oh okay. And, I didn't know that. Year, right, this year is a massive tour. Um, they're going to New York, playing Staten Island. I'm going up for that. But they're also playing in Durham. And that's the closest to, to this region for us. Um, so I was going to go take a, a check on the dates and see. Uh, but they sell out wherever they go. This is yeah. Yeah. There's something that's a little bit compelling about what they're trying to achieve. Yeah. I'm proud of 32 in August. It's when in August, Ryan? Mike Trout is 32. And the question oh, was 32 in August. Okay. Wow. I mean, I didn't think he was that old. Yeah. So, so when is the Savannah team playing in Durham? Anybody know? I'll look it. I'll I'll look it up. Yeah. yeah. Look it, look it up a more. Yeah. Hey Drew, it seems that the Nats go to the Angels, but the Angels don't return the favor. Uh, okay. Okay, so Baltimore will be the closest. So I get to go out to uh, Seattle to visit our kids uh, this this summer, and and uh, so who's in town? Baltimore Orioles. <laughs> 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 go all the way out to Seattle to see them. <laughs> That's funny. That's yeah. a beautiful ballpark. It is. It is. We we the last time we were there, I guess I think it was the Red Sox we saw. So yeah. yeah. You know, I'm, I'm going to try to wrap up my ballpark ballpark tour this year i need philly and atlanta so ah. I think i'm just gonna bite the bullet and drive the full philly and uh figure out how to get to atlanta as well kind of does it count when they change the stadium get a new stadium well this will be my yeah it it does i have to go back to texas and i have to go back to st louis but for my first goal was to get in every city and then uh <laughs> and then i'll do repeats <laughs> so uh the in, excuse me the guardians are playing the uh, nationals on april 14th 15th and 16th true in in baltimore or yeah, in, no, national? in national yeah in that's what, three national? wins you can watch, you can watch yeah and they're games. they're in baltimore they're in baltimore in uh in may i think so I was debate or July. I, I I forget when they're in Baltimore. I didn't realize they were coming to Washington. Yeah. I may have to may have to go up and uh, see them. The bananas are July 14th and 15th in Durham. Oh, okay. 14th okay. Thank you. You beat me, Ryan. Way to go. Probably already sold out. Yeah. Really? They're that they're wow. Hmm. Let's check that out. And they're playing, I think. In Charlotte, also it looks like. Well, that's not a bad, that's not a bad trek either. At July eleventh and twelfth. Oh, that that would make sense. Man of the night. All right, we'll have to uh, we'll have to look it up. I wonder if any of the, I wonder if uh, the Charlotte chapter. There's a chapter up that way. I wonder if they're going. Anyway. All right. Well, gentlemen, I appreciate your uh, attendance. Glad we could all get together. And uh, our next our next official is on uh, the March 23rd. And then uh, we also have the baseball games on June 11th at Richmond to think about as well. So can, can I ask if anybody's going to the Sabre Conference in Chicago this summer? Uh, that's right. July 5th through 7th is in Chicago. Oh. Uh, nice to go to Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got family there. I so talked my good. wife into this. <laughs> good luck. Let me know how it works out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but if it wasn't right after the fourth, I probably would consider going, but I don't have any need to go back to Chicago. Um so but you're already going to be there. You'll enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. All right, guys. Have a good rest of your weekend. And uh, hopefully I'll see some of you on Tuesday. I'll see you okay. Tuesday, Drew. All, All right. right. Take care. Thank you. See everybody.